looking at one-eyed cyclops there on my computer and, and trying to sound uh, somewhat intelligent in the process. We are starting in, this study starts in chapter 8 of Romans, but what I want to do is quickly recap the first seven chapters. I know that's superfluous because I know all of you have looked at all 13 lessons on Romans on the YouTube, right? Wink, wink. Well, that's why we're going to do a quick review of the first seven chapters of Romans. That way we kind of set the stage for... Are you getting a feed okay back there? You know what really helps? When you turn the projector on. I hope, I hope, this, isn't, I hope this isn't a sign of what this evening is going to become. <laughs> In the uh, first seven chapters of, of Romans, Personally, from my perception of those first seven chapters, that is the best passage in the entire New Testament. And this is just personal, personal preference. It is the best passage in the entire New Testament that shows how the, both the Old Testament and New Testament are critical to the gospel. And that's what we're going to go through as, as we go through this uh, review very quickly. And hopefully, I, I hope that you will see it as well, that the, um, those seven chapters are a good way of seeing how the Old Testament integrates with the New Testament in providing God's total plan. Because it, it does uh, really impress me as as being that, in that sense. Let me get this fired up real quick. I've had a crick in my neck for about two months, and turning around looking at that screen is not um, helping me all that much. Now, what do we have in common with the, uh, with the church in Rome, we at the Church of Rosedale, besides... Our names start with the first letter, same first letter. Anyone have any idea? Jessica. We're all the body of Christ. True, we have that in common. Carol? We've never met Paul. And that was the situation with respect to the church in Rome. They had never met him. He was writing to a church that he had never visited. And so they're seeing him... They're reading from him, but they've never really seen him. So we kind of have that in, in common with the particular church there. Now, just to kick us off, there's uh, some basic information that I want to provide. One, the church is in Rome. Is Rome a Jewish city or a Gentile city? Very Gentile. It's the Gentile city that is the capital of the Roman Empire. And so it is very Gentile. What, do, what religiously is uh, the, religiously speaking, is a standard for Rome? Polytheism, idolatry, they're, they're steeped in it. They're people, the people in Rome are raised in it, the Gentiles. Well, we find with respect to the church in Rome that also there is a very significant Jewish population as well. If uh, you look at the first three verses of the first chapter of Romans, you, you find what I, it kind of surprised me. I found what, what I thought was a, a very interesting comment in that text. Let me read that very quickly. Paul there writes, he says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he promised afore through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, 
who is born of the seed of David according to the flesh. What in those first three verses do you find unexpected with respect to a Gentile city and what we would think a Gentile congregation? Seed of David or son of David. Why is he mentioning that to a Gentile congregation? Is that of any import to Gentiles, that Jesus was the, was the descendant of David? Doesn't mean anything. Absolutely, it means absolutely nothing. Who would find that a very necessary piece of information? Jews, Jews would. And he starts right out in the book of Romans, and he mentions Jesus, the son of David, and that really only pertains to those who are Jewish ethnicity. Uh, those who have been raised in what law? The law of Moses. That is thoroughly and completely ingrained in their value systems, in their religious system. And so they would understand that line. Jesus, the son of David. A Gentile wouldn't. It would, mean, it would be meaningless to them. And so that tells us, wait a minute, it's a Gentile city, but apparently the congregation has both Jew and Gentile. As a matter of fact, we see the subject, the subject of Jew and Jewish uh, people come up, and it doesn't come up until the last half of chapter 2, but it comes up in chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11. Those are chapters where much of the text is directed not to Gentiles, but to Jews. And also, it's, it's directed to Gentiles to help them understand the Jewish, Jewish heritage. If you would, skip over to um, chapter 16 of Romans. Just a, a couple of items there. Chapter 16 and verse 3. He says, salute Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. Who's Prisca and Aquila? Do, have, they, have we read about them before? Paul made tents with. Now in, in Acts, in that chapter of Acts, she's referred to as Priscilla. Priscilla is kind of a nickname for Prisca. But we find that he's sending greetings to Priscilla and Aquila, or Prisca and Aquila, who are where? If he's sending greetings to them in this letter, where are they? They're in Rome. They're in Rome. So they are, uh, they are Jewish brethren that Paul knows ahead of time. Well, how did Paul know them? How did Paul know Priscilla and Aquila? Where? Whereabouts in Greece? Now, close, close. A little south of that, Corinth. He ran into Priscilla and Aquila, and they started making tents together there in Corinth, and that's where he first met them. So they were Jews, but they were in Corinth. Why were they in Corinth? Cindy. Right. They had formerly lived in Rome, but when Claudius was emperor, he expelled all the Jews from Rome in 49 A.D., and that's where, and then they end up in Corinth, which makes sense because they were tent makers, and the, in the, the uh, uh, what we now call Greece, there was actually several Olympics. Athens had an Olympics that we, tip, that we typically, typically, typically think of. Corinth had a very, very uh, famous Olympics. They had a lot of people show up, and they all stayed in the Holiday Inn. No, where they all? There were thousands who would come. Where'd they stay? In tents. They stayed in tents. So it could be a very lucrative profession to be a tent maker in Corinth when Paul was there. And so that's why he he meets up and he works with Aquila and and Priscilla. I, I read some. I don't know in in the, in Athens the Olympics. If you won, you got a a, a something of olive olive branches an olive crown or something. It was different in Corinth. I used to know what it was. I think it's spinach or something like that. It's some ridiculous. Cindy. Celery. That's what it was. I knew it was green. 
<laughs> Look what I got, you know. Go to the grocery store and to the produce section and get you a whole stalk of celery and really look like a, an athlete, I guess. Anyway, we find uh, he sends greetings to Priscilla and Aquila in verse 3. Also, if you skip down to verse, verse 7, he says, um, Salute Andro Andronicus and Junius, my kinsmen. What does it mean when they're kinsmen? To Paul? They're fellow countrymen. Fellow countrymen, which means they're what? They're Jews. So now he's sending greetings to both Gentiles and Jews in Rome. If we look at verse, what verse do I want? Uh, verse 11. He says, uh, Salute Herodian, my kinsmen. Salute them of the household of Narcissus that are in the Lord. There again, he's talking about his, his fellow countrymen. In verse 13, he says, Salute Rufus, the chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Who's Rufus? Someone read Acts 15 and verse 21 for me. You turn to that. Acts 15 and verse, no, it's not Acts 15. Mark 15, verse 21. Mark 15 and verse 21. Uh, Dana, would you read that when you get there? And it's part, it's, what is occurring is, of course, Jesus' trial and, and crucifixion. But what does it say in verse 21? Yes. Okay, we have Simon of Cyrene. And he's drafted to, take, to haul Jesus' cross to Golgotha. Simon the Cyrene is, is father of who? Alexander and Rufus. Now, it's quite possible that it's the same Rufus that we're, we're reading about. Otherwise, why would Mark, the writer of the Gospel of Mark, mention Rufus as being the son of, of Simon? So apparently Rufus also was what ethnicity? Jewish, Jewish. So we find not only is there a Jewish contingency in the, in the congregation in Rome, but apparently it's a sizable or significant pre Jewish presence, that, presence there in the congregation. Right. That's, that's a good question. But what do, you, what do you suppose Paul is referring to uh, Dana's question is, it talks about referring to Rufus's mother and mine. What's he saying? Most commentators will say what? Uh, well, it, it, most commentators will say she is to him his mother. And that's because of a close relationship. Not necessarily blood, but because, but because of a close relationship. So, in 49 AD is when Claudius expels the Jews from Rome. And this is going to be tough, because Scott's got to track me on that camera, and I, I like to move around. So I apologize ahead of time, Scott, what you have. Claudius, the emperor Claudius, died in 54 AD. And we know now, as Paul writes this letter, that Priscilla and Aquila have traveled back and now live in, in Rome again. So if you were to, to say that that the book of Romans was written about 58 A.D., then you'd probably be very close. And it's a, it's a good number to get it uh, with, uh, with relative to the time period in which we're talking about. Now, chapter 1 of uh, Romans, and around here something, well, here it is. In chapter 1, Paul speaks the first 17 verses. He's, he's introducing the Roman letter. And then in the second half of chapter 1, you notice verses 18 through 32, he, starts, he talks about the sins of the Gentiles. So understand the, the, the pro progression. If I were to say, if I were to say 
uh, the theme of the first seven chapters of, Ro of Romans uh, is found in this, per in, this in, in the introduction. Um, that's what it's. That's what to me is the theme, at least of the first part of of Romans. In Romans 16, first uh, one 16 through 17, he's talking about. Uh, the, uh, he's introducing himself as a writer and it's to the church there in Rome. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in, the right, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. I would say that's, that's a very succinct and very accurate of the... Uh, theme of the first seven chapters of, of Romans where he says he says the gospel is what what does he call the gospel in that verse the power of God for what for salvation did I go too far Scott <laughs> the power of God for salvation and then and that's what the se the first seven chapters of Romans talks about it talks about the gospel and how it is required and how it is needed by everyone 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 needs the gospel that's what it was revealed for that's what Christ died for is for everyone so that they might be saved through the gospel now what does he say in that passage in the, the second half of that, that first verse? To whom? To everyone who believes, to who? The Jew and the Gentile. So he says, the gospel is for the Jew and the Gentile. Here's our problem. We talked about the Gentiles. They were steeped in idolatry. The Jews were steeped in what? The law of Moses. Here, it, you, we, we talk about divergent perspectives and perceptions in this congregation. You can't get a more divergent spread of perceptions than what you find in Rome. Because apparently you have a significant portion of the Jew and a significant portion of Gentile and they don't believe anywhere near alike. Now, in our country, we have what's called the Christian ethics, Christian being, of course, a parenthetical term. That is, we, we, all, we all acknowledge pretty much the same value system. You've got to work, work, the work ethic, etc. cetera. The, the one God, the concept of heaven and hell, that wasn't here. There was quite a, a, a diversity of perspective when you put Jew and Gentile alike in the same congregation. They're coming from totally different roots. Did Paul expect them to work together? Speaking of the theme we talked about this morning in worship service, you bet he did. You bet he did. So can we work together now in the year 2021 as a congregation, we better, we better. If they can do it, certainly we can expect us to do it. Anyway, he goes on with respect to the Jew and Gentile, and in the, in the notice in the second half of chapter 1, he uh, talks about the sins of the Gentile. But in verse, verses 18 and 19, he says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident, is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. Do we have any excuse? No, we don't. We know, we know, we don't know exactly, but we know we have to, be, we have to treat people kindly. We know we have to be honest. We know we have to be uh, uh, moral. We know that. We know that. As, as Paul says, that's, that's in us. That is evident in us. And so the, what, what then is the conclusion? The Gentiles are what? They are without 
excuse. They are without excuse because they know better. Now, they don't know all the ins and outs, obviously, of God's will, but God has built into them a moral conscience. If we, go, if we look at a verse in chapter 2, for when the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively, instinctively, the things of the law, these not having the law are what? A law to themselves. In other words, we, if we steal from somebody, we know that's wrong. We know that's wrong. And so Paul says the Gentile is without excuse because they are a law to themselves. Sounds. So we begin to see the problem that Paul has to address when he writes the letter to, to, the, to Rome. What he is doing is he's writing to two different groups of people with the same idea that they, that they both need the gospel. Now you're beginning, now you, hopefully you're beginning to see what the first seven chapters of Rome is about, Romans is about. That is, Paul is addressing his letter to two very different groups of people. The Gentiles, of course, he says, are a law to themselves. With respect to the Jews, they are, what law do they honor and live by and eat and breathe? They are the law of Moses. And in both cases, what Paul is going to have to do in these first seven chapters, Paul is going to have to boil both these groups down to the very basics and show them that you may have, may have uh, obeyed according, uh, according to a law prior to this, but you both, you both must now honor the gospel. Now, it's, who do you think it's going to be easier to, to get to understand that, Jew or Gentile? Gentile. All you have to do with respect to the Gentiles, and say, is say, I have seen the resurrected Christ. They got the evidence. They got the evidence. So, to obey the gospel would be uh, a, a rather small step. To the Jew who follow the law of Moses, is it a small step or a big step? It's a giant step. Like he said when he stepped off the lunar capsule, you know, a small step for man, a a, a giant step for mankind. It, it is a giant step for them to accept the gospel, much more so than for the Gentiles to accept the gospel. But Paul is writing the letter to both, both groups. And so he's got to bring them along so that they both come to the conclusion that what? We need the gospel. But it's very much two different groups of people. In chapter 2, and he begins that in chapter 2. Where was I standing when I had the remote in my hand? Those, those, they grow, I don't know how they do it. They grow legs and walk away. Oh, there it is. <laughs> I told you it was going to be a bad night. Anyway, we go to, looking at chapter 2, he begins, with a, he begins to talk about a particular principle. That, because what, he's got to find commonality between these two so that he can bring these two together. He begins in chapter 2 of saying that what? All people will be judged. And it doesn't make any difference if you're Jew or Gentile. We all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So, there's a commonality. You may be Jew, you may be Gentile, but you got this in common. We will all be judged by God. For there is no partiality with God, for all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. If they hear this, what's the Gentile going to say? Yeah, sounds reasonable. 
What's the Jew going to say? Yeah, that sounds reasonable. See how he's starting to bring them together in a congregation that's very diverse? Verse 22, you who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? Who abhors idols up here? Who abhors idols? Of these two, who abhors idols? That's tough to say, fast. The Jews abhor idols. Yes. But, he says, what he's saying is, you may, you may be, uh, uh, you may oppose idols, but you still, what? Three-letter word. Starts with an S. You still sin. So what he's, he's, he's bringing these two groups together through commonality. The first one is, in chapter 2, you're everybody, everybody will be judged, and it doesn't make any difference if their, if their ethnicity starts with a G or a J. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the what? Heart. The heart. By the spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. We will all be judged. Now, with respect to circumcision, don't let me forget this in my hand. <laughs> with respect to circumcision, what is that? I mean, not the, the right of it, but what's the meaning of that in the Jewish mind? Think like a Jew. It's covenant. The sign of a covenant. It's a sign of a covenant, and it's a sign of your heritage. It's a sign of your heritage. The problem with the, with the Jews that Paul often faced is they saw circumcision as righteousness before God. And Paul's got to explain, to, that's not what it is. Uh, circumcision is not righteousness. Circumcision may show that you're of this particular ethnicity and that you're of uh, the, the family of Abraham, but it is not righteousness. It is a, we use the T word, it is a token. Well, the Jews were looking at that as righteousness before God. That's why Paul had so much trouble with them in Asia Minor, with the Jews, and the Judea, we, we use the phrase Judaizing teachers, because they saw this uh, circumcision as necessary, even though you're a Christian, as necessary because of their law of Moses heritage. Paul has to dispel that. He has to make them understand truly what it is. It is not righteousness. It is only a sign of whose family you belong to. In chapter 3, the other thing he, he, he begins, he introduces, those as we see those verses in chapter 2, in chapter 3 he says something else about both Jew and Gentile and what they have in common. He says, uh, sin demonstrates the righteousness of God through the law comes the knowledge of sin. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He shows what he has to show, and here's another commonality that you have, Jew and Gentile alike. You both what? Sin. You both sin. And if that is the case, you both need something to forgive that sin. The law didn't do it. Uh, and that's something that, that he's very specific about. He says, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. That's why, that's why the, the context of verse 23 Romans 3.23 being, what is the verse? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In the context, it makes perfect sense that Paul would say that because that's what he's trying to tell the Jews. Would the Jews understand that the Gentiles have sinned? No problem there. No. I mean, the Gentiles, ooh, the Gentiles, ooh, don't even touch them. That's what the Jewish mindset is. They are the reject of God in the Jewish mind. Do the Gentiles sin? Every Jew said, you're right. That's the way it is. They sin and they always sin. And they always have sin. They are not God's people. We are God's people. Paul says, oh yeah? 
Think about it. All have sinned and fallen short of the God. Uh, uh, all have sinned. Verse 23. And the Jew has to say, yeah, that includes me. So what he's doing is he's, he's bringing these two together in the first seven chapters to, by showing the commonalities he has between Jew and Gentile. We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Verse 20, because by the works of the law, no flesh, no flesh will be justified in his sight for through the law comes what? The knowledge of sin. What's the purpose of the law of Moses? To provide what? The knowledge of sin. Does it provide forgiveness of those sins? No, it does not. It only provides ways to recognize that sin is a reality in people's lives. I mean, you can't get, you can't get more basic than uh, uh, instructing them how to sacrifice for sin. Does it take the sin away? No, it doesn't. It provides the knowledge of sin. I've, I've often thought about what it would be like if I were Jew to, to, to walk the lamb to the door of the, the temple proper and to sit there and, as the old law, old law says, hold my hand on the head of that lamb while the priest cuts its throat. And then to think, and then to think, that lamb died because of what? I sinned. Good thing they didn't have ASPCA back then. But that's the purpose of God, to make everyone, every Jew, as they held their hand there and felt the life leave that lamb or that, that uh, ox or whatever it might be, as the life left them, think, that's my fault because I have sinned. That's what the law of Moses did. It provided a law, uh, uh, the knowledge of sin, but it did not provide righteousness. But uh, now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for those where there is no distinction. Verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Do you see how important that verse 23 is in this context? We all quote it, and we all know it's necessary, but in this context, it was really necessary that Paul explained to the Jews that all have sinned. Because they're, they, would you say that you're a Jew, would you say the Gentiles sinned? Oh, you bet, you bet. Paul's got to show that they have sinned. The Jew has sinned. So now there's, there's it's what the, hopefully what they're beginning to see is there no, there's no difference between what law you have when it comes to uh, the gospel. Everybody needs it. Everybody needs it. In uh, going on in chapter 4, Paul continues his argument to show commonality. He continues his argument to show commonality, and he uses the faith of Abraham to do so. We understand Abraham, as it, as it talks about uh, Abraham's faith was credited as what? Righteousness. That's a, that's a concept, really, to the Jews that they don't find in the law of Moses. But Paul says, Paul tells them that you Jews, remember, Paul, uh, Abraham's faith was credited to him. What's the word, you Jews? Righteousness. And that's what they're seeking. Did they get it from the old law? No, from the old law, they got the knowledge of sin. What they need is a law of righteousness, and the Mosaical law didn't provide that. His faith preexisted circumcision and the old law, and those who obey through faith then become his children. Uh, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 23, or excuse me, verse 3. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, they, the Jews grew up knowing that. That as a reality, that as a fact that they had known about from life. And Paul reminds them of that. And they took great stock in being the heritage of Abraham. And he goes on to say in, in verses 5 through 8, but to those 
but to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. So he's saying, what's the commonality? Is it the law of Moses between the two? Is it the law to themselves? No, no. What's the commonality? Starts with F, faith. That's the commonality. And he begins to explain that faith, faith is credited as righteousness. Faith is the righteousness you need to, to be part of God's, uh, God's family. Verse 6, just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. And what does that require? That requires something that credits us with righteousness so the Lord doesn't take it, it, our sin into account. That's what Abraham did. Now, he goes on to remind the Jews when Abraham's faith was credited as righteousness, was he circumcised? Well, no, he wasn't. Was there a law of Moses? Well, no, there wasn't. So, Abraham, not under the law of Moses, nor circumcised, his faith was credited as righteousness. And so Paul goes on to say, now think about this. Paul says, now think about this. Anyone who has the faith in God that God requires, would righteousness not be credited to them as well? Certainly. Then, who then is, through faith, the child of Abraham? Both Jew and Gentile. Because he says, what does he say about circumcision? Circumcision is of the heart. It's of the heart. And it's of the heart if the person has faith. So, Hopefully you see how he's bringing these two together by helping them to understand that the laws that they live on, under do not work to make them righteous. In chapter 5, it talks about, it talks about Adam. Adam serves as a type of the Christ to come. By one man, you Jews, by one man, Sin entered, uh, sin entered into the world. One guy did it. Or as my sons, when they're young, say, it was one dude's fault. Adam, the first man. It was his fault. Through him, through his sin, what became the curse of all people? Death. Death through sin. But God has... His, Mitch talked about last Wednesday, God has manifested to us his grace, his saving grace. They, un, they are beginning to understand that even though they might be very faithful to the law of Moses, now with the gospel delivered, it doesn't do them a bit of good. They can sit there and be critical of the Gentiles all they want, but they're finding out they're in the same predicament as the Gentiles. They need the righteousness that God can provide, and they can only, and he cannot provide it through the, the law of Moses. Was the law perfect? Was the law of Moses a perfect law? Go like this. Yes. It was a perfect law, but it was perfect in doing what? The knowledge, uh, providing the knowledge of sin. That's what the law is perfect for. To provide righteousness, it doesn't do it. It, it fails. It wasn't designed to do that. It was designed to provide a knowledge of sin. Mitch. Yes. Right. Yeah. You had to establish, the only way you could establish the righteousness through the law of Moses is by doing what? Living completely sinless. And only one has done that. That's Jesus. And Jesus knew when he was commissioned to come to earth that he was going to have to keep it perfectly so he could be that perfect uh, sacrifice for us. 
like he says in Romans, the blood of bulls and goats doesn't work. Why is that the case? Because, the, because a bull or a goat does not experience temptation. They could never be a, a suitable sacrifice. That's chapter 8. I don't want to put it, hold that thought. I realize you've got to hold, for the, hold it for a whole week, but that is, that is uh, uh, chapter 8. Because what we're, what we're showing here is the law of Moses doesn't save the Jew. The law to themselves doesn't save the Gentile. But the law of liberty, now that's where righteousness comes from. That saves us. But He's got to bring these two groups, these two divergent groups together in that single thought, and that's where his task is. And with respect to the Gentiles, that's easy to do. It only took half of a chapter to do that. But in the, in the Jews' case, it's taking several chapters, and you've got to bring them along by showing what they have in common with the Gentiles. And then you show not only the Jew, but you show the Gentile just how necessary this gospel is. And you show the, the, the Jew what the purpose of the Old Testament was, that they have forgotten. Um, and so it, it's, it's a way of bringing people along. In uh, chapter 5, verses 8 through 11, but God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the point. Now, now they're in a position where, where they can say, oh, I see. They're begin, the light's beginning to come on. Before that, if you just said, told a Jew without going through this process that they needed the uh, sacrifice of Jesus for righteousness, you would have a hard time getting them to agree. But what's Paul doing? He's bringing them along so they understand, ah, I'm beginning to see. Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Righteousness, righteousness is vested in one thing. Jesus and his sacrifice. That's where righteousness is. And to access that righteousness, the person has to do what? Have faith. Have faith. Verse 11, and not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we, ha we have now received reconciliation. What does it mean to be justified? If you were standing before a judge in a court of law, what, did, what has to happen for you to be justified of the accusations against you in that court? You have to have proven not guilty. And what you're saying is, I'm justified because there is no evidence against me. There is no evidence against me. Then they say, okay, in the eyes of the law in this court, you are justified. You are set right. That's what re is required for justification. The evidence, the evidence against us is removed. What removes the evidence? Who sacrificed? Jesus on the cross. That's what, justi that's what removes the evidence. We're, Mitch talked about mercy. Mercy. God does not now punish us because he has no evidence against us. And if we are then justified... We are then, starts with an R, reconciled. That is, now, we can walk on the same sidewalk as the judge and his family, because there's nothing against us. We are now part of the people that the judge is a part of, because we have been reconciled. Kevin. Correct. Just as I, the evidence was removed. And then we're reconciled 
Now we can be part of the judge's people because we have been reconciled to the judge. And this then becomes salvation. And that's what Paul is trying to get them to understand. Now he goes on in verse 14 of chapter 5. He says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned, in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. If you ever get confused about the term type and antitype, go to Romans chapter 5, verse 14. Adam is the type. Jesus is the Antitype. That's the semantics lesson for tonight. Because Jesus, it, through his sacrifice, the evidence, through his sacrifice in our faith, the evidence becomes non-existent. And because the evidence, i.e. the sin, no longer exists, then we are reconciled to the judge and his people. And that's fellowship. That's what we seek. And through Christ we get that righteousness. Now, verse 6, I mean, chapter 6, baptism identifies with us with his death, burial, and resurrection. We then put to death our mortal bodies and refrain from sin. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ. What Paul is anticipating in that particular verse, first verse of chapter 6, is, let me read that real quick, let me find it even quicker. He says in that particular verse, he says, What? Shall we say then, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? That's what they might, he's thinking, that's what they might be thinking. If God's grace sin, uh, saves us, then how do we increase that grace? We sin more. That's Jewish algebra. <laughs> They might ask that question. So he, what he does is he uh, answers that question before someone has a chance to ask it. And he talks, about, he talks about baptism. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Verse 3 there of chapter 6. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism in, in, into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in what? Newness of life. If we wanted to be, do you think it's important that we are identified with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection? You betcha. You betcha. We have to be identified with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection before we can be reconciled to his Father. That's how important it is. What's the other way we can be reconciled other than baptism? There ain't no other way. There isn't any other way to be reconciled, that is, to be identified with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, except through baptism. Chapter, uh, excuse me, verse 11. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Because you are now in a new relationship, because you are now in fellowship with God, do not let sin increase. As a matter of fact, do not sin. You are a different person. You're not one who commits sin. You're not one who suffers death through sin. You have been taken out of that. You've got to stay out of that. If you're going to enjoy the grace Mitch talked about, You've got to enjoy the grace constantly. You've got to rededicate that faith constantly. You've got to access that sacrifice constantly. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin. What does that say in, in plain English? Dead to sin. We don't do anymore. That's what it means. We don't do anymore. And that's why he talks about baptism. Chapter 7, death of a spouse removes a marriage covenant. We are now under new law, new life in Christ and his will. Now, there's one, <clears throat> there's one last point hanging out there in the Jewish mind. And that's the reason for chapter 7. There's one last point. What's the Jew thinking? 
But what about the law of Moses? Why are they thinking that? Who gave them the law of Moses? God did. God directly revealed that to Moses. It is God-given. We are expected to live by a God-given law inspired that, uh, that was, was provided to us by inspire, inspired prophets. What God-given law do the Gentiles have? They got nothing. But the Jews, the Jews are thinking, yeah, all this is really nice, but we still got the law of Moses. God gave us the law of Moses. So you can see how this is a, a hanging question in the Jewish mind as he's going through those first seven chapters. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Back up, back up. We've been living by a law that God gave us 1,500 years. We can't just say, oh, We can't say, ignore it. We can't do that, you know. How would a, how would a Jew uh, feel if Paul says, well, just ignore that? They got these big old rocks in Rome. That's a, that would be their response. What they, have to, what they have to realize, and that's why we have chapter 7 of Romans. Uh, so then... If while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit from God. Okay, Jews. Here's the law of Moses. But the law and the prophets said, who was coming along? The Messiah. And because he died, made the perfect sacrifice, lived the perfect life, became the perfect sacrifice, you now are not under this law. And he used for an example the law of marriage. Uh, verse 24. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's, that is Paul's discussion of the flesh and the spirit, the flesh and the soul. He want, his mind wanted him, wanted him to do what was right, but what was leading him astray? The flesh. The flesh was leading him astray. His mind said, you do this, the flesh wanted to do something else. Which leads us to the question, is the flesh evil? For a sinner, who's in control of that, that sinner? The flesh or the mind? It's always the mind. It's always the mind. And what do they fall victim to? The fleshly desire. But it's the mind, the mind that's always in charge. And so consequently, we have to think of ourselves as... as Always, there's always a conflict within us. Our body wants to do something and our mind wants to do something else. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. And his next statement is, O wretched man that I am. And now we're up to Chapter 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Probably one of the most profound statements in the New Testament. Because Paul sees that that's my ultimate solution. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. What they both must, they both are ready to leave these laws so that they can go to the law of what? The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The perfect law. And so we'll pick up... Uh, I went three minutes fast. Far, too far. So we'll pick up chapter 8 uh, next week. Now that you're thoroughly confused and I've completely muddied the waters. <laughs> yeah, we close with a quick word of prayer. We thank you, Father, that you have given us your word. That you instruct us on in how we might be able to stand pure before you and in communion with you and your, your son 
and the angels of heaven. We thank you, Father, that you have given us that opportunity. Help us to remember always how precious, how precious that is and how we must change and completely live our life completely in accord with your word and with your will. Please forgive us, Father. We ask in your son's name. Amen.